Leia here from leiaforsci.com slash MCAT, and in this video, we'll continue our discussion of quantum numbers as it'll show up on your MCAT. You can also follow along with my cheat sheet, which you can download on my website at leiaforsci.com slash MCAT chemistry. In the last video, we compared the concept of quantum numbers to a college dorm, and we also introduced the four principal quantum numbers that you have to know using the mnemonic PAMS. So now let's break it down into great detail. P stands for principal energy level and is designated by the letter N. This has to do with which level on the periodic table you will find that specific electron. So if we look at the periodic table, starting in hydrogen we have N equals 1, and then going down we have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. But just because the table ends at 7 doesn't mean our values end at 7. Because if you have an electron and you give it a boost of energy, putting it into an excited state, that electron can fill an orbital beyond level 7. And so your n value will be all positive numbers starting from 1 and going to infinity. We'll use the formula 2n squared to find out the maximum number of electrons that you can have within a given principal energy level. For example, when n is equal to 1, we have 2 times 1 squared. 1 squared is 1 times 2 is 2. That means we have a maximum of 2 electrons. Take a look at the periodic table. At level n equals 1, we have the hydrogen and the helium. When you look at the atoms on the periodic table, the electron configuration from one to the next is simply the atom in question plus one electron. So helium, in terms of its electron configuration, is just hydrogen plus an electron. Lithium is just helium plus an electron. If you're not comfortable with this, go back to my beginner organic chemistry videos where I break down electron configuration and this concept. And you can find that on my website at leiaforsci.com slash organic chemistry. But the way we want to look at it here is that the table represents all the different possibilities for the placement of an electron. So we said that when n is equal to 1, we have a maximum of two electrons. Well, the outermost electron on hydrogen and helium, that verifies the presence of just those two electrons. If we try 2n squared for n equals 2, that means we have 2 times 2 squared. Well, 2 squared is 4 times 2 is 8. So at the second principal energy level, we expect to have a maximum of 8 electrons. And if we can count 8 atoms, we know we're good. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. When it comes to 3, it gets a little bit harder to see, but let me show you anyway. If we have 2n squared and n is equal to 3, we have 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. But if you count the atoms at principal energy level 3, it looks like once again we only have 8. 2 in the s area, 6 in the p area. But don't forget that the 3d orbital is higher in energy than the 4s. So after you fill 4s, this area is actually 3d, and that means we have 3d1, 2, 3, 4, and so on in the electron configuration. When we count the 3d, we can't forget those electrons, and that means we have 2, 10, and 6 for a total of 18 electrons. The next quantum number to look at is A for azimuthal quantum number, and this is designated by a lowercase l. The l represents the orbital in which the electron is found, and on the MCAT, you only have to know the s, p, d, and f orbitals. Mathematically, the range for the azimuthal number is from 0 all the way to n minus 1. When n equals 1, n minus 1 or 1 minus 1 is 0, and that means we only have the 0 orbital, which is the s orbital. When n equals 2, n minus 1, 2 minus 1 is 1, and that means we have 0 and 1, or s and p. When n equals 3, n minus 1 is 3 minus 1, or 2, we have 0, 1, and 2, or s, p, and d. And finally, when l equals 3, we have f. We'll use the formula 4L plus 2 to determine the maximum number of electrons within a specific orbital. So for example, if L is equal to 0, we already said that's the s orbital and we should have a maximum of 2 electrons. Let's see how that works out. We have 4 times 0, which is 0, plus 2 equals 2, and as we predicted, the s orbital only holds 2 electrons. We know that P holds 6, so let's prove that. 4L plus 2 p has a value of 1. So we have 4 times 1 plus 2. That's 4 plus 2 is 6. 
and the p orbital does have six electrons. Now let's see how you combine them. So for example, at the level n equals 3, we have values for L of 0, 1, and 2, and that's because n minus 1 is 2. That gives us an s, p, and d orbital. Let's see how the math adds up. We have 2n squared, where n is equal to 3, and that means 2 times 3 squared. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18. Let's see how we get those 18 electrons. If we have 4L plus 2 for the s orbital, this term is 0, and that means we have 2 electrons. If we have 4L plus 2 for the p orbital, where L is equal to 1, we have 4 times 1 is 4 plus 2 equals 6 electrons. And finally, we have 4L plus 2, where L is 2 for d. That's 4 times 2 is 8, plus 2 is 10. 2 plus 6 is 8, plus 10 is 18, and that's the 18 electrons we predicted from 2n squared. Remember, this is the maximum number of electrons, but you don't always have a complete shell. The next value we want to look at is m, which stands for the magnetic quantum number, designated by m sub l. Think of m sub l as the suborbital of l. In the s orbital, you don't have any suborbitals. Remember in the last video we said a studio apartment doesn't have individual rooms? But the p orbital is broken into three orbitals. We have px, py, and pz. And that would be the m sub l designations within the l value. So l is p, m sub l would be px, py, and pz. Mathematically, we can calculate m sub l from negative l through positive l. And don't forget to have the zero in between. Since s is 0, negative 0 to positive 0 is still 0. But p being 1, we have negative 1, 0, and positive 1. That's how we get our three suborbitals for p, or x, y, and z. For d, we have negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, and positive 2, for a total of five suborbitals, and so on. Now, even though you have multiple suborbitals, they don't necessarily have to go in order. So don't worry about which one represents the negative one or the zero or the positive one. Just recognize the total value that you have and that when they fill, each gets one electron until all of them have one. Then you backfill a second one into each. The final quantum number S, which stands for spin, is designated by the M sub S. In our apartment example, we said we have the A portion of the room and the B portion of the room. But in quantum numbers, we designate this as a positive one-half or a negative one-half. Every suborbital can hold up to two electrons, and they'll have opposite spins to cancel each other out. So we'll have the up spin and the down spin. Which is which doesn't matter because we're not calculating this at a physics mathematical level. We're simply understanding that there are two types of electrons. What you do want to know is that if you have multiple suborbitals that are each half filled and all their spins are aligned, so for example, you have one electron each in px, py, and pz, all at m sub s equals positive a half, these are said to be parallel electrons. We'll discuss one final topic here, and that is the shape of the orbitals. For the MCAT, you're not expected to know the complex mathematical shapes, but recognize that the s orbital is a simple sphere where the center of the orbital is the location of the nucleus. The orbital itself is the location of the electron, but it's constantly moving around. And the farther away you go from the orbital, the less likely you are to find an electron there. For the p orbital, we have the figure eight or infinity symbol, and we have three of them. px in the x direction, py in the y direction, and pz is coming half forward and half back. So we'll show the forward with a dark, bold, uh, orbital, and we'll show the back with a dotted orbital like it's fading into space. If you want to put it all together, you have px, py, and there's your pz. Remember, you can find this entire series along with a cheat sheet on how to calculate quantum numbers on my website at layaforsci.com slash mcatchemistry. Are you overwhelmed by the sheer volume of information required for the MCAT? Are you worried that lack of a proper study plan and low MCAT score will prevent you from getting into medical school? My new ebook, The MCAT Exam Strategy, a six-week guide to crushing the MCAT, will help you formulate a concrete study plan by helping you figure out where you stand now, identify your goals, and figure out what it takes to reach them. And it's yours free when you sign up for my email newsletter at mcatexamstrategy.com. 
By signing up for my email newsletter, you'll also be the first to know when I have new videos, MCAT study guides, cheat sheets, tips, and so much more. The link again, mcatexamstrategy.com.